for um, the kind introduction. Um, I, my name is Hei Chin, as uh, I'm introduced. Uh, I am a faculty of international studies at Iwa Women's University, and I'm a historian, uh, I have to say. I specialize in uh, modern Chinese history uh, with focus on media uh, and politics. I hope all of you are enjoying this exciting at HCAP conference. This might be the last day right before you leave. Uh, and I feel very fortunate to have this great opportunity to discuss the impact of the internet and the social media uh, on China's authoritarian role with students of Ihua and Harvard, uh, both of which schools I have deep sense of connection. Um, so I hope you all enjoy uh, this lecture as well. Since I'm a historian, we'll explore this issue of the internet uh, by reflecting upon the historical trajectory of media development uh, and its impact on the tumultuous dynamic of politics in modern China. So it will not be a story of China's internet per se, but putting it into the longer historical process in order to provide new perspective. So I'll start with the new, this question, uh, namely, what kind of images do you have about uh, Chinese media? Oh, excuse me, I have to change the uh, PowerPoint. Oops. So what kind of images do you have of um, Chinese internet or the social media? If, uh, censorship, good, good. Other people? Yes, uh, you know, it's notorious. Uh, have you been to China? So you probably will have a hard time getting access to Facebook or Twitter, right? Other people, but I'm sure you know the way. Um, yes? Uh, I'm not sure if this is the English translation, but 50 Cent Army? Yes, uh, these party members who is in charge of, uh, you know, censoring contents, online contents. Uh, for each content, they will probably get about 50 cents. Uh, and so, yes, there's a, you know, this ideas of you know, strict censorship in China. What else? Um, last year I heard a brief lecture by one of the Harvard professors who was conducting research on this topic. Mm -hmm. And he said that individually, um, Chinese citizens could post messages of discontent, but collectively once they tried to incentivize action by saying we all should meet up and go protest, then they were censored. So not just censorship, but selective censorship that blocked Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. Um, so is it Professor Gary King or? Probably. Oh, yes. Some statistical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he has published this work on, on the censorship. Uh, yes, I mean, you, you could still see that people are lively, you know, posting their public discussions on uh, their own uh, version of Twitter, uh, namely uh, Chinese Weibo, right? The, the, the Sina Weibo, you probably heard of it. Uh, and you could see that people are actually um, are you know actively engaging uh, in the public discussion online, uh, and uh, indeed um, Chinese government uh, seems to be somewhat lenient on some of the critical views on the government, at least at the local level. Uh, but when it comes to mobilizing people for you know anti. Japanese demonstration, for example, uh, they become quite strict uh, and, and very efficient in cracking down on those contents, right? So good, good, very good. Um, so, um, you know, you, you seem to be very, you know, cosmopolitan and, and really uh, have been following up all these media, uh, you know, coverage of the Chinese media. Uh, and um, it might be almost impossible to not read about Chinese uh, media, right, or, or internet uh, these days on global media outlets. Uh, and it's, it is quite intriguing that there are contradicting images of the media in China. On the one hand, the authoritarian uh, Chinese government imposes strict censorship on the internet and the social media through the Great Firewall, as you pointed out. Uh, on the other hand, we often hear about the lively and vibrant discussions uh, on political affairs appearing in blogs and microblogs, which became powerful um, enough to generate public opinion pressure on the government. Well, mobilizing power of social media uh, and the internet 
strong, powerful influence in Arab Spring, as you know, uh, around you know, 12, 2011 uh, onward. But the role of the SNS in Chinese Jasmine Revolution uh, in the same period remained limited. Nevertheless, with the expansion of the social media, uh, the internet is becoming an important public space for political uh, in contention uh, in China. So my lecture consists of two parts. I'll first talk about uh, China's online activism and the state. Uh, and uh, I'll finally talk about the history of media to uh, think about uh, Chinese internet in the historical perspective. Okay. So uh, Chinese internet arrived um, in China uh, in the late 1980s. Okay? Uh, since then, uh, Chinese government has been an active promoter of the you know, development of in information and communication technology, so-called ICT. Uh, and it is estimated that the number of the internet users uh, will be go up to 650 million uh, by this year. Uh, so China's internet is now virtually the world's largest cyber community. And one of the most important recent developments uh, in uh, Chinese internet uh, is the expansion of the social uh, media, social networking services. Uh, the new social networking services includes blogs, microblogs, uh, so-called Weibo, uh, instant messaging, and internet built-in board systems. Uh, and um, as you know, uh, Facebook uh, is not allowed, so they developed their own local uh, version. Um, then how is it different? How is the SNS different from uh, the traditional media, uh, such as newspapers, TV, or radio, uh, in terms of its relationship uh, with the state. How is it different? Uh, well, you can think about the case of China, uh, but also in general. You probably are you know, active users of the SNS, right? How is it different? Uh, there's much lower barriers to entry for someone to express their opinion in a way mm -hmm. that people can hear those, uh, mm -hmm. those messages. Mm -hmm. You, yes, definitely very good. Uh, you, people will have better access, easier access to, you know, these uh, services uh, to exp express their opinions. Other people? It's not one-way communication. People can interact with each other. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So it's not a unilateral uh, communication between, or let's say, the government uh, and the people, but people will uh, rather more um, horizontally communicate with each other. Very good. Other people? Okay, um, so yes, I mean, there's a big differences, uh, especially uh, compared to the uh, you know, traditional media. Blogs are, f in, in the case of China, blogs are freer from state control, right? Uh, bloggers are usually less affected by the pressures to comply with the state policy okay? um, in deciding the media contents, uh, which is different from uh, journalists working in China's official media. You know, they often have to go through these uh, very uh, delicate and intricate uh, monitoring and, and review system uh, with embedded in the media system. So um, the new social networking services allow the Chinese citizen uh, in participating in the public discussions with less interference uh, with the state. So I, I guess that's uh, one of the important changes that was caused by the SNS. Well, uh, we, we just talked about um, the um, expansion of internet. Um, there seems to be good reasons why Chinese uh, government should worry about the expansion of the internet and social media. Uh, and it was more challenging for the state to control online um, contents than the traditional media contents. Uh, nevertheless, the Chinese government has been relatively effective in enforcing strict censorship on online contacts. And one of the basic methods uh, for the media control is for the government uh, to send uh, directive, uh, to censorship directive uh, to the media. Uh, and you know, usually they will regularly send out documents 
of you know, which uh, content should be censored, uh, which is, uh, you know, content could be published. Okay? And then secondly, uh, this is quite important, uh, that uh, government would often make the internet service providers responsible for uh, the behavior of their consumers. So what then, what would happen? If the, you know, let's say that one of the big uh, service providers, uh, so-called Sina, right, uh, is responsible for uh, the uh, contents of the media, then what will happen? I mean, the internet service providers would essentially police their own services. Yes, it will promote self-censorship, basically. It will, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, that's what exactly happened. Uh, and these companies will often hire a huge number of censors uh, to uh, you know, impose their own self-censorship uh, in China. And there's uh, the Great Firewall. And, um, and this disallows certain entire websites from operating in the country. Uh, and then there's a key f word filtering. Uh, this stops a user from posting text that contains uh, banned words or phrases. Okay. Uh, and then there's uh, content filtering. This is basically uh, manual censoring by censors, internet police, uh, and internet monitors. And yet, uh, despite all of these strict uh, censorship, uh, you could see this uh, lively uh, political contention online. Uh, and you know, the authors like Guo Binyang would say uh, this is the um, uh, you know important uh, uh, you know changes, uh, namely this the rise of online activism. Okay, uh, there are a variety of issues that is uh, discussed online. Uh, it includes popular nationalism, right defense, uh, corruption of the government officials, right? uh, and power abuses by the government officials, environment, uh, and online charity. Okay? Um, and in the context of the strict censorship, uh, netizens uh, needed some strategies, right? Uh, net netizens uh, still uh, aspire to post their own uh, opinions online, but then they know that there is boundaries uh, that is set by the state. And so they often use you know, indirect languages, satires, uh, or images to avoid uh, the government censorship. Um, and this is uh, very intriguing uh, that oftentimes uh, people would um, expose local officials' uh, misconduct online, and this is often not part of the censorship uh, contents. Uh, in other words, you know, let's say if someone posts criticism against Xi Jinping, then it's more likely to you know, get censored. But let's say uh, if someone posts a uh, village chief uh, in one of the villages, um, then uh, they'll most likely uh, to uh, get uh, government response to the government uh, official's conduct or misuse uh, of power. Why do you think that is the case? If you have uh, learned some about you know, Chinese politics or, um, you know, Political reform in the post ma period. The question again? Okay. <laughs> um, well, you, you took contemporary issues in East Asia, right? Um, so, what would be the political context in which you know government allow uh, the public discussions or criticism against the government officials? As one of the students also pointed out about that, right? Government is quite uh, lenient toward uh, the abusive. I mean the you know, public discussions or criticism against the local officials. As opposed to like um, criticism of Xi Jinping, I saw, um, I feel that like the local media are just at the net. Uh, government got the um, government's distance because, because. <laughs> okay, uh, we, can, we can come back to you. Uh, other people? Yes? Well, I feel like, 
Yes, very good, very good. So in the context of uh, economic and political reform in the post mao period, government is quite concerned about uh, you know, maintaining its political legitimacy and uh, to somehow find a way to channel those grievances uh, and discontent of the population. Uh, and, uh, and this is, a, you know, the government actually uh, saw this uh, a very good way to channel those discontents. Uh, and, and so uh, that's actually one of the important reasons why they allow the criticism against the local officials. Very good. So it, it, it's also a way um, to, you know, um, you know, put a lot of pressure on the local officials uh, so that people will have some, uh, you know, channels to uh, vent out their uh, grievances. And uh, another one important one uh, is that in the context of economic reform, you know, China have gone through decentralization basically, uh, and you know, the the, the local government. Uh, increasingly have had more power. And it was hard for central government to, you know, uh, you know impose check against those local officials. Okay? Uh, and so uh, it, what, it, it became a very important way to, uh, you know, have supervision over these local officials. And, you know, try to use this as a way to check against the abuse of power uh, by the local officials. So this is a very distinctive feature uh, of the online activism uh, in contemporary China. And we often see some of the cases uh, in which, you know, the people express their uh, grievances and discontent and ultimately, you know, government have to respond to this public opinion pressure. So we also see some kind of positive cases uh, in along the line, especially since 2003, uh, in the case of, uh, you know, Sun Zhu Gang uh, case. Um, so, we can see that while the state continues to enforce effective control over the media, the internet and the social media, despite the limits, also play an important role uh, as a watchdog of the local government, if it's not the you know, central government. Then how can we understand uh, these rather contradicting images uh, and of the internet and the social media in China? Uh, there are diverging views on the political implication of the expansion of the internet and the social media uh, in China. Right? An optimist will argue that the expansion of the internet and the social media in China may have a liberalizing effect in Chinese politics. They see the internet as a new channel uh, to express individual opinions with less interference with the state and as a new means to promote uh, government transparency and accountability. Well, scholars with more skeptical views would argue that the Chinese state's continuing internet censorship and skillful use of the internet will lead to the Chinese state's continuing consolidation of power despite the change. Which argument do you think is more persuasive for you? You probably had certain ideas about, uh, you know, Chinese internet uh, or the social media. Any thoughts? Well, uh, I hope you will have some ideas by the end of this lecture, so so we could have some discussions. Um, as a historian, uh, I would say uh, both views uh, could be uh, somewhat problematic. Especially because both views adopted the framework uh, that is developed out of the liberal model of the media uh, in the West. Um, then what is the liberal model of the media, right? Uh, this framework uh, insists on the normative ideal of the neutral watch, independent watchdog and perceive the liberal model as the most modern. Okay. 
In the liberal model, uh, news media should go through full-flown uh, commercialization to achieve the degree of the autonomy and the independence of the state. So finally, independence of the news media from the state is a precondition for the news media's role as a watchdog of the state and check on the government. Okay. And what do you think might be the problem uh, if you apply this to the Chinese uh, context? Well, um, the problem is that Chinese did not go through uh, full-flown commercialization uh, to the extent that media will achieve complete independence uh, from the state in history. Okay? And I will explain that uh, in, a, in a few minutes about how uh, Chinese media developed. So thus, uh, based on this framework, skeptics would often assume that Chinese media cannot play its role as a check on the government due to the lack of independence and autonomy from the state. So it's very likely to get into a very pessimist point of view. Um, or more op optimistic scholars uh, provide a rosy prospect that Chinese media will achieve independence someday in the future if it goes through advanced commercialization. Okay. So by examining um, the history of media in China, I'd like to provide a new perspective in understanding the relations between the Chinese state and media by going beyond the liberal model. Okay, you know, we want to, I want to look at specific uh, historical condition of China, okay? which is very different uh, from European or American uh, experience. So uh, I will argue that you know, you know, uh, the state uh, power uh, incrementally expanded uh, in terms of its control over the media in the context of the state building, war, uh, and revolution. And gradually, uh, you know, state became a dominant uh, actor uh, in the field of media, uh, and yet uh, without independence. Uh, the media could also st still uh, play its critical function uh, within its limits. So I'll try to explain how that uh, evolved in the context of China. So before we go on, I'd like to look at these three periods. You know, from, um, we'll first start uh, from 1850s around. I'll be very brief, don't worry. We'll, we'll uh, cover a very long period. Uh, I hope I will not. <laughs> make you too bored, but uh, I'll be very brief in explaining each period. Um, I, I realize that uh, it's quite ambitious to cover all of this period, but I, I hope uh, I, was persuade, I was persuading myself that it will be rewarding uh, to discuss all of this period. So we'll start from the uh, Qing period, the last dynasty, okay? Uh, the Qing dynasty, uh, it, which was maintained by imperial system, right, with the emperor. Uh, but then the new republic was established in 1911 through revolution, uh, through this 1911 revolution. So we'll try to uh, work on this period from 1911 to 1949 as a republican period, okay? Republican period, and from 1949 uh, onward, it's uh, PRC, People's Republic of China, right? Uh, and in between, uh, this is supposed to be the uh, early republican period from 1911 to 1927, uh, and from 1927 to 1949, this is a uh, nationalist government, uh, you know, governed by the Nationalist Party. It's one party rule, as you know. Uh, and during this time, the Nationalist Party also competed with the Chinese Communist Party. But ultimately, somehow, the Chinese Communist Party gained its victory uh, by 1949. So we'll try to cover all of this period. Uh, and um, I guess one of the important periods that I'll emphasize is the Sino-Japanese War. Uh, and I'll try to also explain the impact of war uh, in the history of media as well. 
Uh, this is a brief overview of uh, the history of media uh, from 1950s to the 1980s, and I'll try to explain that. Um, and the Western media arrived in China uh, in the 1950s, uh, excuse me, 1850s. And um, in traditional China, before we go on, um, in traditional China, they had uh, this traditional media, so-called uh, Peking Gazette, Gazette uh, or Jinbao. Jinbao. Um, you probably never heard of it, but um, this official gazette uh, is, was a very important means of communication for uh, Qing Dynasty. Okay? This was basically, uh, you know, journals or newspapers circulated only among officials within bureaucracy. Okay, this was a very important way for political communication. Uh, and they did not have this kind of commercial newspapers that was circulated uh, nationwide uh, in China. Okay? They had some local you know, news, uh, you know, newspapers, small newspapers for commercial purpose, but not the national one. And, um, and this means that government uh, managed to monopolize okay, publicity over public affairs. Okay? Uh, and in the, in, the, in the case of uh, you know, Western newspapers, uh, you know, it was much more uh, open. Uh, and and you know, these citizens were able to you know, have their own access to creating publicity as well. Well, in, in traditional China, they also had this concept of uh, public opinion, uh, Wilu. Uh, and this uh, is basically uh, elite opinion, not popular opinion uh, within bureaucracy. And also they had this kind of similar concept of watchdog in China too, um, that uh, this concept of Qingyi, uh, pure discussion, this is basically righteous elites uh, opinion in opposition to the corrupt government practices. Okay, they had this concept. So um, when the new media arrived, uh, this really created a, you know, caused a big change uh, in China. That really uh, you know, made uh, you know, government lose some of these uh, monopolies over the uh, publicity on the po uh, political affairs. And um, most of the newspapers um, in the early years uh, from the 1850s uh, were published in the trade ports uh, outside of uh, Qing jurisdiction, uh, such as uh, Hong Kong or Shanghai. Uh, you probably heard of the Opium War, right? Uh, Ch the Qing uh, government was very powerful until the 18th century. But by the uh, in the early 19th century, the Qing government was declining and was defeated by the British Empire. Uh, and as a result, uh, Qing Empire had to accept uh, unequal treaties and also allow the establishment of treaty ports uh, in, in which uh, foreign merchants uh, from the West will be able to uh, do their business uh, without uh, the you know, reach of the Qing uh, you know, jurisdiction. Okay. So basically, uh, these newspapers uh, had more autonomy from the Qing jurisdictions uh, and uh, had a, quite a broad readership from literati to merchants. Uh, and one of the most famous one is called uh, Shenbao, uh, which was published by uh, this British merchant, Ernest Major. And this is the map of uh, the Shanghai Treaty Port as a treaty port uh, in the 1930s. But uh, you can see that this, uh, this is Huangpu River. You probably have, some of you have probably been to Shanghai. And uh, this is Huangpu River. And this is old part of the city. Uh, but here is international concession, uh, mostly uh, you know, governed by Brit British authority. And in the south is French concession, uh, you know, governed by um, French authority. And um, most of the newspapers were located uh, in this area, in the international uh, settlements. Okay? And this is the picture that I've taken from Shanghai History Museum. This is a, a wax figure. 
this is the you know streets where uh, these newspaper offices uh, were located uh, in Shanghai uh, in the treaty ports. Uh, this is image of Jingbao, um, official gazette. Well, then uh, you know China uh, was going through this phase of revolution and reform. Okay? There was a competition be between uh, reformists and revolutionaries in the late Qing, and they they actually uh, both parties would publish uh, this political press uh, in. Uh, from the 1890s and 1900s. They're mostly short-lived and limited circulation because it was not uh, often you know, for profits and, and they have these partisan views. Uh, and if, if you look at uh, the uh, development of media in the West, you can also see this phase where uh, you know, this political press uh, flourished as well before going into the commercialization. Okay? And during this time, a lot of elites promoted uh, this uh, publication of newspapers for strengthening the nation because they had this sense of crisis. Uh, and also, they promoted this idea of media as a watchdog of the government, uh, you know, supervision of government, uh, like by someone like uh, Liang Qichao, who he was the uh, most influential intellectual uh, during this time. And then if you go to the 1910s and 20s, uh, you see this accelerated commercialization, especially because this was time when the central government was quite weak. And then uh, you, know, you go through this next phase where uh, the Nationalist Party established its government. And this really was the you know, starting point of the rise of the party state in China. The current government is the party state, uh, which is ruled by one party. And this 1930s was the starting point for the rise of the party state. Uh, and so, but then still during this time, uh, the media was dominated by privately owned uh, commercial newspapers. Okay? And it was often controlled and managed by shy capitalists and financiers. But then of course the nationalist government uh, as a one party uh, government uh, needed to gain control over this media. Uh, and so uh, this, uh, they would often impose uh, censorship, uh, press law, or bureaucratic uh, penetration into the commercial newspapers. In other words, they would often buy shares of the commercial newspapers uh, secretly. Okay. So you can see that uh, this is a map of the nationalist government, which unified China uh, by 1927. Uh, and this, these are uh, you know, the major newspapers in Shanghai. And Shanghai is the, uh, you know, was the center of the media uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, and so these are one of the largest newspapers uh, in China, uh, in, in whole China. And you can see that uh, still it was uh, privately managed and privately owned. Uh, but there's also some newspapers that was uh, controlled by government, okay? controlled by the government officials. So gradually, you can see that the government, uh, the state power was expanding uh, from the 1930s as part of the state building. Okay. And then you can see that also the number of circulation increased over time right? uh, from uh, 1920s onwards. And if you go to 1930s, it uh, maintained its circulation number of 15, uh, 150,000. Which is not a, a you know a, you know high number uh, for uh, if you compare it with Japan uh, during this time. Uh, one of the leading newspapers in Japan, uh, you know, they had uh, the circulation number of about one million during this time. So it's not as uh, you know as advanced uh, as in, in China in Japan. Yes. Is the circulation just in Shanghai, or does it go elsewhere? Elsewhere, well. it includes the nationwide circulation number, uh, because it, it, you know, especially the newspapers like uh, Shenbao, uh, Shenbao or Xinwenbao was the largest newspaper in China, so you can see that there is some limits. Well, but it's often also said that actually there are, you know, actually more than ten people who who would uh, read one newspaper 
Uh, so you could, the number of people uh, who read the newspaper are higher uh, than these numbers. Uh, but still, you can see that uh, it's still limited. So it's quite different from the Western uh, experience that you would uh, have this accelerated uh, you know, uh, commercialization and then ultimately will expect it to gain independence. But uh, even when it's not well fully uh, commercialized, the state power was expanding and you know, in enforcing uh, control over the media. Okay, any more questions? Yes? Well, uh, that's because I didn't have the data <laughs> uh, for that period. <laughs> uh, but uh, yes, uh, but it, it, there was a continuing uh, you know, um, uh, circulation of the Shambhal. Um, that's a very sharp point. Uh, I will try to get more data on that. Um, okay. Um, and I would have to say that in the history of um, media in China, this wartime, uh, this Sino-Japanese war uh, from 1937 uh, to 1945 was a critical juncture uh, in the development of the news media. Especially because uh, most of the largest newspapers were located in the treaty ports, uh, such as Tianjin in the north, or in, the, in Shanghai in the south. And this coastal area was occupied by Japan by 1938, uh, nine. Uh, and so um, a lot of these capitalists, Shanghai capitalists, lost their control over uh, you know, the, their own uh, newspapers, especially uh, after the Pacific War, uh, especially because after the Pacific War, Japan, Japanese military managed to occupy the whole Shanghai uh, in, in the trade ports. Uh, whole Shanghai, including international settlement where newspapers were located. So um, once it was uh, confiscated, you could see that uh, you know demise of these uh, commercial and privately owned newspapers uh, in Shanghai. Okay. And but the problem is when the nationalists came back. Okay. Uh, what they did was that they will also justify their confiscation of the newspapers on the ground that these newspapers collaborated with the Japanese okay, during the wartime. Okay? So nationalists, uh, when they came back, also managed to confiscate uh, newspapers uh, very easily okay? uh, after 1946, uh, after 1945. And so you can see this uh, continuing expansion of state power uh, over time in the early 20th century. And the expansion of power, um, well, this is a map of uh, China. You can see that um, you know, the coastal area was occupied by the Japanese. Right? Can you see the map? Um, it's not so clear. Maybe I should have turned off this light. Uh, but the, um, the coastal area here, was occupied by Japan and the nationalist government uh, in a flat to Chongqing uh, during the wartime. And this is the basis of the Chinese, uh, the Chinese Communist Party. Okay? Uh, and most of the newspapers, uh, this largest newspaper, nationally circulated newspapers, are located in Shanghai uh, or in Tianjin. Uh, and so you know, quickly it was controlled by the Japanese. So uh, when the nationalist government came back to Shanghai uh, or Tianjin, uh, they could easily confiscate uh, the newspapers. Well, this is um, so uh, by 1946, you can see that uh, most of the newspapers, GMD means Nationalist Party, okay, Kuomintang. Most of these newspapers, except for one Hui Ba, okay, uh, most of newspapers are uh, politically affiliated newspapers, uh, directly controlled by the party or uh, you know political uh, factions or government institutions. Um, so 
the expansion of the state power uh, culminated uh, in 1950s, as you can uh, imagine. Um, when the Chinese Communist Party uh, occupied, uh, unified China, uh, they could also easily confiscate a lot of media establishment uh, by saying that uh, you know, they were uh, the media controlled by the nationalist, uh, their political enemy. Okay? So they could easily uh, control uh, this media uh, once they came um, into power, even um, without using their ideology, uh, the socialist ideology. Okay? Uh, and so by 1953, uh, you know, China, Chinese government managed to nationalize uh, newspapers, okay? and by the 1950s, most of the media were nationalized. It, this means it, it is owned by the state, uh, and the media is managed by the state. Okay? And um, they had this also ideological opinion, underpinning uh, in justifying their media control, uh, and they often say media uh, is the mouthpiece of the party. Okay? How do they justify this? They will say, well, party represents people's interest, right? Uh, and so party is supposed to, uh, you know, represent people, uh, and, uh, and thus uh, media should uh, follow the party line and party policies. So they uh, advocated this so-called party principle and say media must accept the party's guiding ideology must propagate the party's pro programs, policies, uh, and directives, and must accept the party's leadership. And then they also emphasize the mass uh, line. Okay? This so-called, um, from the masses to the masses, they really emphasize mass mobilization. Okay? They emphasize mass mobilization. Uh, and um, media was perceived uh, as an important tool uh, to implement the mass line. Okay? And then intriguingly, uh, in the socialist China, uh, in Mao period, they also emphasized uh, media uh, as a means to supervise the government or the party. Okay? They promoted this criticism or self-criticism, okay? so-called. Uh, this really uh, encouraged uh, citizens or non-party uh, you know, citizens to uh, criticize government uh, officials or the party officials. What do you think? Would people dare to criticize? Well, people were very hesitant, uh, you know, in, especially when the state power was increasing. And then people had to go through a lot of severe political mass campaigns where uh, a lot of people were purged for uh, attacking the government or criticizing the government. So people were uh, not so there uh, to you know, criticize the government, but still they had this concept, at least in the uh, Mao period. And this uh, idea actually was emphasized in the recent years in China by uh, promoting this concept of uh, public opinion supervision. Okay. Uh, by saying that media should play its, its role as a supervisor uh, of the government. Okay. And that's one of the contexts in which government allows the exposure of the abuse of power by the local officials. Okay. Um, and another important um, idea is that you know, the Chinese Communist Party promote, promoted this press freedom. Okay. But um, press freedom can be enjoyed only by people, not by enemy of the people. Okay, this is an interesting idea. So if someone is defined as the enemy of the people, you, you know, these people will be deprived of the press freedom. So it's quite different from uh, the concept of the freedom, uh, press freedom in the liberal sense. Okay? And you know, they even interfered uh, in the reading practice of uh, newspapers. Right? Uh, can you see what they're doing in this picture? Uh, you can see the newspapers here. Right? Uh, this guy is reading newspaper for the illiterate uh, citizens. Uh, you can see that they're not necessarily focused uh, in listening uh, to, to the newspaper reading. Uh, and doing, uh, there's a kid here, 
Uh, and so, you know, they even, uh, you know, the, the state power expanded uh, to the extent that, um, you know, they will interfere uh, in the you know, reading practice of newspapers. Uh, but it doesn't mean that they would uh, receive the messages, uh, you know, as uh, the, the party wanted uh, to inculcate. Uh, but it will, that's another question. But the CCP tried uh, to expand this. Yes? Huh? Yes, uh, by the early 20th century, it was um, about 10%. Uh, but if you include people who can write uh, their names, uh, and it could go up to 20s uh, and 30s. Uh, and so it's very, uh, the literacy rate is very low uh, during this time. So this is, you can, you can you know, um, understand why people, I mean, the CCP tried to use this kind of method to educate the people, to, to you know, inform the you know, people about the party policies, uh, to make them, uh, get them mobilized. Okay. But you can see that uh, during the PRC, the literacy rate increased over time. Okay. Um, and then, um, if you finally, we are going into the last phase. Uh, hopefully, uh, I'll uh, be able to wrap up. Um, so, um, in, in the post Mao period, uh, the government uh, decided that China needs some uh, changes. Uh, you know, as you can see, that in, in the Mao period, the state uh, really is directly controlled uh, the media uh, from the center. Okay. Uh, and you know, the problem in the post Mao period was that um, financially uh, it was not uh, you know, uh, working uh, for a lot of uh, government, especially because uh, the government uh, was not able to afford all the subsidies that they have been providing for the newspapers or TV stations or radio stations. Okay. Uh, and so what they did, <coughs> excuse me, was to um, cut off all the subsidies, uh, not all, but some subsidies, uh, and encouraged uh, you know, commercial financing. So uh, in this context, they allowed uh, you know, advertising. Because during Mao period, advertisements, <coughs> excuse me, uh, advertisements were not uh, allowed. Uh, but uh, you know, by the uh, you know, early 1980s, uh, advertisements were readopted, um, so the, these media uh, could rely on advertisings uh, on their um, for their uh, finance. Um, and then also they uh, transferred ownership and managed rights rights to the lower level of government. So you know, right now you can see that a highly decentralized structure uh, of media. Okay, well, as in the Mao period, it was much more centralized. What, what will be the consequences of this commercialization? Yes? Very good, very good. It, you know, they will try to, you know, well, financially, they will be uh, you know, less dependent on the government, right? Good, good. Other people? In general, if you, well, we discussed that a little bit in, in the beginning about the I impact of the commercialization. Well, what would be the, you know, what, how we will the you know, policies of the media offices will change? in response to the commercialization. Vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, this, uh, you know, in the context of state-dominated media structure. Anyone? Well, um, they will, you know, in, in the socialist media, because they needed to get subsidies uh, in, in the Mao period, they needed to get subsidies from the state, right? So it's very important to somehow uh, cater to the government's uh, demands, right? government's interests. But now, um, because it's commercialized, it becomes very important to you know, uh, increase the circulation numbers, 
or to you know, sell uh, advertisements for this media, uh, it becomes uh, also important to cater to the interest uh, or the taste of the readership or viewers. Right? So you can gradually see that uh, there is some changes uh, in the uh, media contents. You can see the more expansion of enter entertainment media contents these days to cater to the you know, interest of the uh, readers and viewers and audience. But on the other hand, you could see that still government managed to you know, impose strict censorship and media control. Okay. So I guess in this context, media had to satisfy both, you know, satisfy uh, readership and, or audience and satisfy the government. So they are kind of uh, have these set uh, boundaries in which they could function. But I think you could see that there is, that the boundaries uh, has been broadened uh, comparing to the, you know, uh, Mao period. Okay, any questions so far? Yes? So you mentioned how this commercialization has broadened the range, I guess, of the uh, news media and what it aims to do. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering, this all exists sort of in the domain of what the government allows to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So to what extent can we really be saying that the boundaries expand if these boundaries are still confined within whatever the government chooses to set? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So your, your question is, is, it, is this bound, expansion of boundaries significant enough? Yes, because I feel like it might be sort of an artificial concept to be saying that the boundaries of what the news can cover now or new, new, what news will cater to now is changing because in the end it's still all under government control. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. I feel like we might be, I'm not really convinced that there's going to be a change in boundaries because the government still does control everything through censorship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is a good question. It is also, it's, it's a very important dilemma uh, for you know, scholars of, of Chinese media uh, in that, you know, still, you know, I, I, have, I will, uh, you know, discuss it in, in the, as my conclusion uh, in terms of how we could understand this uh, in terms of, uh, you know, understanding Chinese internet. Um, can you see this as really uh, um, going into the political uh, liberalization? And I will say no. Uh, and, but then I have to say that if you compare with Mao period, uh, where uh, the, the central government uh, controls everything uh, and there's no uh, financial, uh, you know, uh, uh, income uh, outside of the state, uh, then um, it, it's, you know, you have to rely more on the state. So you're right, you're right. Uh, you know, the boundary has not been expanded dramatically, maybe very little. Uh, so people are trying to understand uh, how much, uh, you know, boundaries has been expanded. Uh, but I have to say, though, uh, you know, this is indeed, if you look at it, uh, so uh, I'll explain that how uh, we should understand uh, this uh, Chinese internet. But I have to say that uh, in the context of, uh, you know, Chinese environment, okay, um, still this is a significant um, change because you probably have this idea that the media still is not independent. It's not still autonomous from the state. Then what? What does it matter? You know, why is the, why does the boundary matter? Isn't that your your question? Right? Exactly. So uh, I have to say uh, that um, you know these. Um, well, that's actually my uh, conclusion uh, for for this lecture. Uh, and so, but that uh, that you know. Um, even without independence, still, uh, there is some a function uh, that uh, the media plays, especially in the post mao period, uh, especially you, if you look at uh, this, uh, you know, uh, the rise of public discussions against uh, in the government abuse of power uh, of government officials. So uh, that's what, exactly why I, would, ha I had said that we should go beyond that liberal model. So we should not assume that, you know, uh, you know, the government, I mean, the media needs to be independent uh, to play this critical role uh, as, as a watchdog. Uh, 
but uh, still we need to understand that in the Chinese context since we have been discussing how the media developed uh, in the Chinese context. So maybe my conclusion will help you to answer uh, your question further. Uh, any more questions? Okay. So finally, um, so you could see that uh, you know, there was uh, this incremental expansion of state power over the media in the context of the state building uh, from the 1930s, right? War, uh, Sino-Japanese war, and socialist revolution, right? From the 1950s. Um, and, and this uh, state-dominated uh, uh, media environment, uh, media did not necessarily seek independence uh, from the state, okay? Uh, we haven't really went so far to discuss this actual relationship, uh, but you can see that uh, you know, media did not have strong incentives to try to you know, resist against the state or challenge against the uh, state, especially when the state power is dominating. So their strategy was quite different from you know, the West. Okay? They will not often pose, uh, you know, res well, they will sometimes pose, uh, you know, uh, you know, protest or uh, resistance, but oftentimes they will rather, uh, you know, seek uh, to get connected with the government officials uh, in order uh, to uh, have access to a lot of resources, financial resources, or you know, access to the news uh, information to to get interviews from the government. Okay, uh, you, you, it, it becomes more useful to have better connection with the government than to gain uh, independence in the, in the Chinese media environment. Okay. Um, and so this, I think, is quite uh, different from what we have seen uh, in, in, the, uh, in the European experience. So uh, I have to say that um, this really uh, helped us to rethink about how we understand uh, Chinese uh, media. Okay? Uh, and also, um, I have to say that um, we should not just assume that you know, without independence, uh, there's no critical function of the uh, media. Um, media still can play its role as a you know, watchdog or check against the uh, government, uh, if it's not central government. Uh, within, without, uh, within the limits, uh, limited boundaries. So then, uh, what is the implication of the history of media uh, in China for understanding uh, China's internet? When understanding the impact of internet in politics, we should not assume that China's internet uh, as a media institution is constantly struggling to gain independence from the state and is resisting against the state interference. You know, oftentimes we have this framework of you know, state control versus, uh, and uh, you know, resistance of the media against the state interference. If you look at um, one of the you know, microblog companies, uh, you know, these uh, you know, uh, Sina Weibo, right, uh, thrives by forging a close relationship with the state. Uh, you know, by collaborating, uh, cooperating uh, with the state uh, in terms of its censorship and whatnot. And the internet and social media still play the role of the watchdog without uh, you know, autonomy or independence from the state, uh, even though it's limited. Um, thus, it will not be too useful uh, to discuss, um, from, at least from my point of view, whether this phenomenon will lead to the political liberalization or the regime uh, consolidation. And I think it will be more fruitful to understand the actual role of the internet in specific circumstances of China. So I'll stop here and we'll have more discussions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.